Today we're going to be reviewing the Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross. Now while most car reviewers would complain of the Eclipse Cross's rental spec, basic interior and somewhat bland driving characteristics, we're going to be taking a look under the hood and underneath the Eclipse Cross to see what's inside and if there's anything that separates this from its competition. And we're going to start under the hood of the Eclipse Cross where we have a turbocharged 4 cylinder engine. This is a 1.5 liter unit, it's situated transversely slightly on the passenger side for front wheel drive. Now underneath the airbox side we do have a CVT transmission and it is hooked up to an all-wheel drive system. Now taking a general look at the layout under the hood here, on this side we have the windshield washer reservoir, the coolant jug, at the back there we have the ABS module, we have the engine's intake side on the front and the turbocharger and exhaust side on the rear. Over here we have the airbox, the master cylinder, we have the battery underneath this air duct, we have the ECU here and the fuse box on the corner. Now if we start with the air intake system on the Eclipse Cross, we have cool air drawn in from the front of the vehicle through this duct that goes over the battery and into the air box. Once it gets filtered out, it passes by the mass airflow sensor and heads straight down into the turbocharger at the back of the engine bay. Now that turbocharger is going to use the flow of exhaust gases to speed up and pressurize the air which is going to travel through this charge pipe and head down the front here to the air intercooler. Now taking a look on the lower grill of the vehicle, you could see that air intercooler across the bottom. Now from underneath that charge pipe is then going to go into the air intercooler in front of the radiator and then come out on this side here and head back up. The air is then going to head up from the intercooler up to this mass airflow sensor and then into this drive-by wire throttle body before going into this plastic intake plenum and then into the engine head. Now replacing the air filter on the Eclipse Cross is pretty straightforward. There's just two big clips here to remove. You pick this up and then you can pull out the air filter pretty simple. Now with that air intake removed we have clear access to the battery as well as the top of the transmission. You can also see that pipe that's going to lead down to that turbocharger located at the back there. We've also got this extra pipe here that comes off of the valve cover. Now that's just for ventilation. The actual PCV valve is located over here and tees off to the intake manifold. Now also on top of that manifold is your purge valve for the EVAP system. So now that we know how air enters the engine we'll next take a look at the Eclipse Cross's fuel system and this one's pretty interesting because this engine is not only direct injected but it's also port injected which means that you're not going to have to deal with carbon buildup issues but you'll still get the power and efficiency of direct injection. Now the low pressure pump in the tank is going to bring fuel up to this high pressure pump here and it's driven off of the exhaust camshaft at the back here. Now that high pressure pump is going to bring one line down to here underneath to the direct injectors. You can see the fuel rail starting here underneath the intake plenum to four injectors that go directly into the combustion chamber. You can see the pressure switches on this end here. Now teeing off of the pump is this low pressure line that's going to go to the fuel rail right on top of the intake plenum to these fuel injectors which are going to inject into the ports before it goes down into the combustion chamber. Now looking at the top of the Eclipse Cross's engine, we do have a plastic valve cover. Now this engine does take 0W 20 weight oil, which is pretty typical. And the engine oil dipstick is located back here. Usually these are colored yellow in many vehicles, so it's easier to find. Now taking a look at the underbody of the Mitsubishi Eclipse, things are somewhat flat underneath here, but there really isn't much covering other than this bumper cover right up at the front here. The rest of the engine, transmission, and even the drive line and exhaust to the back is left completely exposed. Now you'd think that having no access panels would be good for serviceability but if you take a look at how the oil filter is positioned yeah you can access it all right but it's going to drip straight onto this pan so you pretty much still have to take off this front cover in order to change oil and i am kind of surprised that there's a fram oil filter on a brand new mitsubishi now with the front cover removed we have clear access to the engine on this side and the transmission on this side now changing oil in the eclipse is pretty straightforward we have the drain plug over here and the oil filter over here now just above that oil filter you could see the oil cooler now servicing the spark plugs are also pretty straightforward. You have four ignition coils that are easily accessed right on top here so you can swap out spark plugs. Now over here on the passenger side just underneath this valve cover and the timing cover down below we do have a timing chain which is good because you don't have to change it over the life of this engine. Now on the front side here we have our intake camshaft and the back side here we have the exhaust camshaft. Both carry variable valve timing control. You can see one of the oil control valves for this side here. There's no electric motor powering these oil control valves like in some newer vehicles. Now just ahead of that timing chain setup is the drive belt setup. You can see this here is where the alternator is located and the drive belt and there is quite a bit of room to work inside of here. Down below there we do have the water pump and then at the front here we have the AC compressor. The tensioner is located just off to the side here. 
I like though that I can actually get my hand in here and work on this belt or the water pump. A lot of other vehicles bring this pulley right up to this frame rail here and you can only access things from down below. Now the alternator is just sticking right out here. There's just two bolts that hold it onto the block and it's pretty easy to service without removing too many components. Some other vehicles you actually have to disassemble the front end in order to get to that. Now even though the AC compressor is probably best access from down below, you have clear access to it from the top here if you need to do any work on it. Now here's a look at that AC compressor from down below. It's really Really small and tiny I can almost grab it with my whole hand and here's a look at the drive belt setup from down below there is an access panel that you can remove on the splash guard side in order to get even better access to it and here's a look up inside of that access panel you can see up above there the tensioner here we've got the water pump the AC compressor and the crank pulley and now we'll have a listen to the startup sound Now taking a general look across the engine bay of the Eclipse Cross, you can see it does have its fair share of plastics, but for a modern turbocharged vehicle there really isn't too many complex things like electronics that you would find in most typical turbocharged cars like a Ford or a Volkswagen. Now on this side we do have the battery, the ECU is located behind it which is a little bit further away from the front of the vehicle to protect it in any impact, it does have the steel casing on it, however it's still subjected to heat cycling from the engine. Over on the corner here we do have have this fuse box which is nicely labeled. Next up we'll take a look at the transmission on the Eclipse Cross. Now this is a CVT unit but perhaps its most exciting feature is it actually comes with a real dipstick and this dipstick is easily accessible not like a Mazda where it's buried down below or a fake one like a Nissan where the dipstick parts actually sold separately. This is a legitimately accessible dipstick where you can check your transmission fluid or refill it through the same hole without the need to deal with scan tools or an overflow plug. Now looking at the top of the transmission we do have a cable shifter there's no shift by wire here and if you come down in front of here you have the starter which is very easy to access you pretty much don't have to remove anything except its wires. Now perhaps a little bit more difficult to see this gray thing here is the transmission cooler which is going to exchange engine coolant with the transmission fluid in order to cool things down. Now just before we get to the transmission this here is where the rear main seal is located and it kind of looks like it's already weeping oil which is a little sad. Now the transmission on the driver's side of the vehicle has this steel oil pan underneath and it has a drain plug which is going to make for easy drain and fill CVT transmission fluid changes. Now the transmission oil filter is located over here and the cooler is over there. Now one thing I don't like is that the externally run transmission fluid from the cooler out to this filter over here which could subject it to rupturing and therefore you run out of transmission fluid. I'd rather if all the fluid was moved internally inside of the transmission and the coolant lines attached to it externally. Now the starter motor from down below is even easier to access. There's so much room to work here. Now after that CVT is done selecting its ratios, it's then going to take that power out to the front differential located inside of here. It'll then travel out to the transfer case for the all-wheel drive system over here. Now the transfer case is going to take transverse power and put it longitudinally to that drive shaft that runs down to the back. Now servicing this transfer case is pretty straightforward. You have a fill plug at the top here and the drain plug down here. There's no electronics or anything controlling it from the front here. Now all that power sent to the rear drive shaft is going to come at the back here to the rear differential but before that it has to go through the all-wheel drive control unit. Now the magic of the super all-wheel control that Mitsubishi is marketing happens inside of here where we have an electric actuator that's going to actuate a set of clutches inside of here and it's going to vary the amount of torque that is allowed to come through to this rear differential. Now the rear differential differential is then going to split it out to the two rear wheels at these axles. Now servicing the rear differential is pretty easy. You have a fill plug here and a drain plug there although it's a little tight to access that fill plug. Now the size of these rear axles are a little bit bigger than you'd find in vehicles in this class so I think this Mitsubishi definitely qualifies for its super all-wheel control in the soccer field or the mall parking lot. Now taking a look at the front suspension on the Eclipse Cross, we do have a McPherson strut front suspension and that strut's going to bolt up here at these two bolts to the steel steering knuckle. Now what's interesting is this is still based on the Mitsubishi GS platform which was shared with some Chrysler products like the Jeep Compass, Patriot and Dodge Caliber. And you can still see some of those similarities from cars from the mid 2000s based on the shape of the control arm and the subframe. Now the stabilizer link joins at the top here at the strut and connects down here to the sway bar that goes over to the other side. Here we have the inner and outer tie rod 
and we've got a stab steel lower control arm. Now accessing the control arm bolts are pretty straightforward. Just one bolt at the back here that drops down and another one here that unbolts this way. Now looking at the suspension from underneath, we do have these stab steel lower control arms that have these welded on reinforcements. Now one thing I noticed is a really tight clearance between this control arm and this subframe. Now this does lead up to a steel steering knuckle, but luckily we do have a bolted on style hub, so you don't need a press to change bearings. Although you do need a press to change these ball joints because they are pressed into this control arm. They also use a pinch bolt design, which tends to rust up when you have to change them. You might have to hammer this out in order to get it out. Now while the McPherson strut suspension is perfectly acceptable from a vehicle in this class, I think it's time for Mitsubishi to update this platform and move away from Chrysler's platform and perhaps move on to some Nissan based platforms to whom they've joint ventured with. Now one thing that's nice is that the Eclipse is still using a metal radiator support which means that it won't crack in any minor collisions like a plastic one would and it'll be nice and sturdy. You could probably even jack up your car from here. It also uses a full steel frame so you have a stamped steel subframe that runs along the side here and then out to the back over here. Most other vehicles are just getting away with this back part and doing away with the side and the front pieces so you have less structure holding the car together. Now overall I do appreciate the layout that Mitsubishi's done under here. Although being a turbocharged engine things are laid out really simple and easy to access and service and I also noticed the lack of rust unlike say a Mazda or a Nissan that I've reviewed. This car's got about 11,000 kilometers on it and there's not a speck of rust especially for not having any of those fancy undercovers. Now looking at the Eclipse Cross's rear suspension at the back here we do have a multi-link style suspension. Now here we have a shock absorber and a spring integrated together into one strut. Here we have the upper control arm. It looks a little weird. It's just a thin piece of stamped steel that runs along this length here. Now in the front here we have a stamped steel control blade, nice and big, and it actually kind of joins and integrates itself into the knuckle. Now looking from the back we can see that lower control arm where the strut mounts to at the bottom here and the stabilizer link that mounts to it over here. Now the knuckle design is quite interesting because it just integrates the stamping of the control blade into the knuckle itself. There's no actual cast piece that it bolts to. Now looking down inside of here we do have a front lower control arm. Now it's worth noting that all the components in this rear suspension here is stamped steel. There is no use of aluminum with the exception of the stabilizer link housing. And here's a look at the rear suspension from underneath. You can see the subframe is made of a stamped steel like material all throughout. Again I am surprised that there's actually no rust anywhere to be found here. Now it's also worth noting they don't include cam bolts on these lower control arms. Now the Eclipse Cross has two main engine mounts. One over here on the passenger side connected to its frame rail and one over here underneath the ECU on the transmission side that connects it to the left side frail rail. Now the last engine mounts located underneath here which ties the transmission to the rear subframe. Now we're going to take a look at the cooling system on the Eclipse Cross. Things are pretty simple under here especially for a turbocharged engine. There really is only one cooling circuit. There's no two separate cooling systems like you'd find in say a Volkswagen. We start here at the radiator fill cap which is also the pressure cap for the radiator. We do have the overfill reservoir located off to the side here. Now coming off the top of the radiator is this upper radiator hose here which goes directly into the engine block. There's no fancy electronics or control systems going on here. Now to cool the turbo we do have an extra line that goes out to the turbo over there and we do have this return line that comes back into this hose here. Now the lower radiator hose starts over here and comes into the engine block at this point where there is a plastic housing that houses the thermostat. Just three bolts and then you pull this hose off and you can access that thermostat. It's actually located just behind the water pump over here. Now the water pump is a bell driven style. There's no electric water pump here and it's pretty easy to access just a couple of bolts that hold it onto the block once you get the belt off it'll just fall right off and there is a good amount of room to work inside of here. Now teeing off of the upper radiator hose we do have a set of lines that go this way towards the transmission cooler underneath the battery and then another set of coolant lines here that go towards the oil cooler located down at the filter. Now cooling things off on the Mitsubishi Eclipse we have dual electric radiator fans at the front here. Now to remove the radiator luckily you don't have to remove the front fascia you just have to remove this upper radiator support out of the way and then the radiator will just lift right off. And here's a look at the cooling fans from down below. I don't know why Mitsubishi has chosen to use a white fan on this side and a black fan on the driver's side. At least they give you a petcock valve to drain the fluid unlike some other brands where you have to disconnect the lower radiator pipe in order to drain the coolant. Now the Eclipse Cross's engine starts here at the turbocharger where we have an integrated exhaust manifold. The exhaust is then going to travel into this turbocharger to spool up and pressurize the air intake. It'll then come back down past this oxygen sensor down into the catalytic converter and then further down to the flex pipe underneath. Now here's a look at that exhaust manifold from underneath. Taking a look back over here you can see we have the catalytic converter as it comes down and then it goes into this flex pipe and then out to a secondary catalytic converter 
out the back. Now that exhaust is then going to pass through a resonator, another silencer, and then around the rear differential, up around this way and then into the muffler at the back here before exiting out on the right side of the vehicle over here. Now the exhaust does point downward and is hidden by the rear bumper so there's no fake cutouts but you can't really see the exhaust. And now we'll have a listen to the exhaust. Next up, we'll take a look at the braking system on the Eclipse Cross. Now things are pretty traditional where you have your master cylinder and a vacuum powered brake booster. Now if you follow that vacuum line, it actually leads up to the front of the engine over here, which takes vacuum from the intake manifold. Many other turbocharger vehicles have to use an external vacuum pump in order to power that booster. Now following the lines from the master cylinder, it'll lead you over to the ABS module located underneath the firewall here, which is responsible for any traction, stability control, or any safety features on this vehicle. Speaking of safety features, this is a brand new 2020 vehicle and there's still no radar sensor located in the front here or down below here, which is kind of sad. You can even get radar sensing and autonomous braking on a Corolla nowadays. Taking a look at the front brakes on the Eclipse Cross, we do have a single piston floating caliper on a disc rotor. Now this does look kind of small for an SUV, but you could tell from the size of this rotor shield here that there's probably some room for expansion and you could throw a bigger rotor on here and a bigger caliper. Taking a look at the rear brake side up on the Mitsubishi Eclipse Cross. We do have a floating caliper design with this disc rotor. Surprisingly, this rotor is almost the same size as the front rotor. Now the parking brake setup is a manual cable type parking brake setup, but unfortunately it does attach to the caliper directly, which is gonna make it a little interesting when you're changing pads and you have to retract that piston. Now the fuel tank is a steel tank and it's not covered off by anything. Now there's one part of the fuel tank on this side, then it humps over to the other side here. Now, of course, one of the downsides to having these undersized exposed is you're gonna have a lot of noise vibration and hardness traveling into the cabin and it's not going to be protected from any salt and corrosion that spills up against it in the winter. Luckily though the fuel pump is accessible once you remove the rear seat unlike many SUVs where you have to drop the tank. Now the EVAP canister is located way at the back here just behind the rear bumper. Now this vehicle does not have much of a rear overhang so if you do ding something back here or get hit this EVAP canister is not really well protected. Now the Eclipse Cross is steering rack it has a column mounted power steering motor and it just comes down to the steering rack which is mounted to the subframe and goes out to each wheel through the tie rods. Now looking up inside of the steering column this is where the power steering motor lives. Now the interior I'm not going to really talk about because there's a lot left to be desired here. There's a lot of scratchy plastics, blank buttons and things that remind you of features that you could have had if you bought a Honda or something. Under the hood though I give Mitsubishi a lot of credit for having a semi-modern powertrain design yet having all these components very easy to access and work on and with nothing being overly too complex. However the real question we have to ask here is how long is this powertrain going to hold up and if it does how difficult is it going to be to source parts for this engine if things do break. Now in my opinion I think under the hood the Eclipse Cross does have a lot going for it as a CRV competitor although I don't think it does deserve that Eclipse name of its predecessor. Now you tell me in the comment section down below, what do you think Nissan should do with this brand? Do you think that that 1.5 CVT is just a placeholder for a fully electric platform coming soon? Now make sure you follow me on Instagram to find out what the next car review is going to be and subscribe for more videos just like this one.